Hear the Lord before buried treasures. We're going to, I'm not going to read through all the scripture just for sake of time. And if you have a, a paper um, or your phone and put some notes of the scriptures in. But Joshua 7 talks, it's the story of Achan. And most of us know where he, huh, no, let's, let's read it. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. I'm reading out of the New King James Version, the only anointed version out there, but I'm just kidding, I'm totally joking. There's a lot of translations and scripture verses. I love the, the passion. He, um, we ministered in his church quite a few years ago, and he's just an amazing man of God, apostolic man. And, to see him come out and start rewriting scripture. It's a translation, but I'm sorry, it's a paraphrase, but it's still, it's very accurate. It's just an amazing, you can only get books of it at a time right now. You can download them, but uh, 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 Joshua 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed the trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. It's interesting. One person takes an accursed thing, takes something that they weren't supposed to. He basically stole something. He robbed something. Because it was very much said that you're not to plunder this gold and stuff. And whatever you, uh, ever you bring, don't hide it. Like bring it to, bring it to the leadership. Verse 2, now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. And so the men went up and spied out Ai. Verse 3, and then returned, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not worry all the people there, for the people of Ai are a few. Verse 4. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. That's kind of not the way it was supposed to go down. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim, and struck them down on the descent, Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. It talks about, you know, struck them down on the descent. They were literally running back down the hill. And chances are, they were fearful so much, they ran so fast, their, their legs and feet didn't keep up. Anyone ever feel that when you're running down a hill and you get going faster and faster? That's probably what transpired here. Verse 6, then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads because they were shell-shocked of what had just happened. It wasn't the normal for the Israelite army. This wasn't the normal aspect of what was to transpire. And Joshua said, alas, Lord God. Why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Verse 8, O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? Verse 10, so the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Get up. Why do you feel that you've lost? What, why do you feel the attack that came against you defeated you? Why do you feel that my name is getting marred in the attack? In verse 11. Israel has sinned, so he's answering, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them, for they have even taken some of the accursed things, and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore, unless you destroy the accursed from among you. 
And that's a pretty clear statement of God right there at that moment. It's interesting because through all things, God has the truth. And the truth sets you free. Get up, verse 13. Get up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. Because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come by man. You interest in the analogy of all the tribes, and then from the tribes, it will be according to the families, and then from the families, it will be according to the households. And then the households, according to the man. It's, it represents a lot of the body of Christ as the churches, as the tribes. We like to call the windward is a tribe. It's a tribe. And in that tribe, you have all these families. And in that family, you have all these men and women and children. Verse 15, then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. And you're going to say, wow, this is positive, Brent. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarites, and he brought the family of the Zarites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And then he brought his household man by man in Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, and the tribe of Judah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Now Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. Verse 21, and when I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, it's interesting how money draws and how possessions draw. And 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them, and there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent, and there it was hidden in his tent with the silver under it. The purpose, what later goes on, is Achan ends up being stoned burned and stoned and, and stoned and burned and um, it's sad I mean it's, it's terrible it's 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 all it's Old Testament it's Old Covenant I understand that but we need to have a reverence and holy fear of the Lord that's very very important and as I continue talking in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 19, verse 9, and he commanded them, saying, Thus you shall act in the fear of the Lord faithfully. That word faithfully means truthfully, and with a loyal heart. Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man, because here's the second part of 2 Chronicles 19, 9. I'm going to go through a lot of scripture so you know it's not me speaking, it's the word of God. Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man will abound with blessing, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. What that word faithful is the same word in 2 Chronicles 19, 9. On, and he commanded them, saying, Thus you shall act in the fear of the Lord faithfully. How? A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he doesn't hasten himself for quick wealth. He doesn't hasten himself. You know, you know, quite often, people that work hard to be rich very fast tend to have family and friends dislike them because they've all bought into some marketing system or something. You all bought diamonds from Africa. There's no diamond plant, you know, or something like that, whatever. There's not, no mine over there or whatever. It, we need to be careful. And people have asked me, I'm not against multi-level marketing in any way. I'm just against untruth. If it's truthful, great, it's awesome. Jump in, go for it, build. And so many people have said, and come and approach me, Brent, here's this product, would you come on? Because if you come under, you come under me, and if you're not with what you carry and your, your voice out there and all these churches and ministries you go to, you will become wealthy. I know, but if I become wealthy under you, that makes you wealthier. And I'm smart enough to know in business, I'm not going to make you wealthy. I'll go get something myself and make myself. I know, I'm just kidding. 
So I refuse from the pulpit. You'll not see me promote things other than Ford. I'm sorry. You will not see me promote thing, uh, Starbucks. I'm sorry, Mandy. That's out of my mouth. Unbelievable. No. You will not see me promote businesses or multi-level stuff from the pulpit for a reason. Because I don't want to prostitute what God's given to me. And he's given me a platform. And I want to make sure that my platform is for him and him alone. But I want to see you all blessed. I want to see you so blessed that you've got phenomenal stuff and things that you're pouring into his kingdom. Amen? Uh, Job 28, verse 28. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Very interesting, Job 28, 28. Behold, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. I, I don't want to preach a gospel that's fearless, but I want to preach a gospel that's fearless. I want, I, I want to preach the word of God that, that we must have this holy reverence, fear of the power and the authority of God. Not that he's this big bad God looking for you to make a mistake so he can spank you and beat you and abuse you. No, that is not the thought pattern of God. The thought pattern of God is that he sent his one and only son into this earth to die for you and I so you and I can come back into an intimate relationship with him like Adam and Eve did in the garden before they sinned. That's the God we serve. But I will tell you one thing, things that I have seen in the supernatural realm, the presence of his presence that I have felt in my own life, there has been multiple times that I thought for sure I will die just in his presence. Because of the power and the authority of him and his kingdom is way beyond our human body's ability to withstand it. Wow. Oh, that was a good picture. Oh, that's a great picture. Thank you. That was great. Roaring like a lion. Thank you, Dora. He has one of my few fans right there, but thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Dora. You're amazing. But the seriously is, there are some people that take the fear of the Lord to mean you must fear me. In Spanish, we say, cuidado. Un curva muy peligroso. You're coming around a corner that's very dangerous. You shouldn't fear me. You need to fear him. Again, it's not a fear of human understanding. It's a reverence of his authority, the creator of all things. Grasp this concept for a moment. If nothing else, we can come to church just to grasp the concept of his amazing power. Who he, who do we follow? Who is he? He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning from the end. He, he has no beginning. He always has been. He's created all things. He even created free will. So you and I wouldn't be robots and puppets. He created free will in the angelic realm, and Lucifer chose to rise up against the creator of all things because he had a stupid moment called a moment of stupidity. I was a swear word when I was growing up, stupid, but I felt I needed to swear. <laughs> the devil had a stupid moment, dumb moment, ridiculous moment that he actually thought because the love of God was so great for him that he gave him a free will that the Lucifer for a moment started to think that he could actually have more power and authority than the one that created him. That's called stupid. It wouldn't look any different than any one of us having trials and tribulations, struggles and frustrations, people coming against you, heaven forbid slandering you. To think that we have to carry that and wear someone else's opinion when their opinion is none of my business. And when we start to get frustrated, hurt, and burned, and tired, and exhausted by all the junk that's out there, we start to depower God in our lives. And we start to sit back and we start to sometimes cry out, has anyone ever thought for a moment in their mind, I why have you 
you forsaken me? Has anyone ever thought, God, why are you allowing this? Well, or worse yet, God, why did you make me sick? I don't think he made you sick at all. I think the devil made you sick. But I'll tell you what, even in the sickness, God wants to work his truth. Through everything. Now, God could, I guess. I mean, he wiped out whole tribes and different things through, as we know. But now in the new covenant, we're not living with old covenant law. And so the discipline actions are looking a lot different than they did back in the old covenant. Because Jesus was killed for us. Jesus became the slain lamb. Jesus became the offering, the sacrifice. And when he rose again, he brought you and me into the optional place of an authority within his father's kingdom. He brought you and me into the optional place. And I say optional because the only thing that's optional is your free will. That's the only thing. I will guarantee you when you read through scripture, I know exactly where you and I are called to be living in our life. You and I are called to be living the testimony of Jesus. You and I are called to go forth into all the world, preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, and cleanse the lepers. You and I are called to do greater things than Jesus himself. You and I are called into the greatness of what he did on that cross and what he did three days later when he rose again and he defeated the devil in every form, in every way, and he defeated the curse of sickness, sin, and death. And you say, well, we're still going to all grow old and die. Oh, absolutely, but you don't need to die. Well, what do you mean? Talk about a crazy weekend. I get a call this morning, and, and she, one of Sharon's uncle just passed away this morning at 1 o'clock. I've been up since like 4 o'clock this morning. This morning. It's not able to sleep, things going on. But I tell you what, Uncle Lawrence, missionary, him and his wife for all these years, on, in Africa, building wells and watering systems to, to, to purified filter systems. He's got patents on these things that are still going out to all these very remote areas where they actually purify their water to drink using natural resources. Oh, he didn't die. He just got transferred from glory to glory. And I refused to let the say the cancer killed him. No, I actually think God was probably so in love with him that he finally, Jesus might have said, Oh, I get him. I get him home. But in the meantime, we pray against every sickness, sin, and disease. And we pray because we are commanded to go into everywhere and do what? Heal the sick, to raise the dead. I believe physically and spiritually. I believe heal the sick physically and spiritually. There's a lot of sick people, sick theology, sick doctrines, sick control. Anyone ever felt controlled by somebody? I do every single time those red and blue lights pull me over. I feel powerless. It's like my explanations don't matter anymore. I can usually talk myself out of a lot of things, but once in a while there's one thing you just can't talk yourself out of. <laughs> I'm joking, I have a clean driver's abstract. I've never had an accident in my life that's claimed to mine. But I did have some speeding tickets. That was a long time ago. Drag racing, you know, 16 years old. But I outran a lot more than they could. Oh, did I say that? Sorry. Sorry. The reality is, there's a purpose you have life right now on this earth. First of all, the most important purpose is we have life everlasting. That our soul is transformed. What's your soul? Your heart, your desires, your mind, your will, your emotions. That's your soul. And that has to be transformed and renewed every day, growing and increasing. Because if it doesn't get transformed, then we start to remember the problems, the issues, the addictions, 
And when we start to get a little weak in our physical body, that enemy just starts jabbing at you, jabbing at you, jabbing at you. But you know what? If you feel the jabs, I want to tell you something. It's the lie of a deceiving devil. You're feeling depressed? It's a lie of a stupid devil. My kids call that the S word. I feel bold this morning. Put that lion back up on the screen. I do, I feel like I'm ready to rip the chairs apart or something. <laughs> Maybe it's winding me up from Mexico. Anyone feel bold? When I get bold, do you get scared? Please don't. I get bold, I hope you get bold. Because if our boldness is in the fear of the Lord, And our boldness is actually his boldness, walking through us as testimony. But if our boldness is in the fear of men, then it goes to the other message I thought of teaching this morning, called orphans, called insecurity. Because we try to perform for man's eyes. We try to perform for our position. I'm glad the church has no performing positions available. I'm glad nobody ever wants to come up here and preach when they know they shouldn't, but they still want to. I'm glad nobody goes beyond what their call is. I'm saying that a little facetious. It's your call to be great, and it's good to walk in the greatness of your call. But that doesn't always look great in the eyes of men and women. Thing. Eee, 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 eee. That was an angel sword swinging. I'm not going to go through the whole message. Because the Lord showed me very clearly that we're supposed to end off with a fire tunnel. But I want you to hear something. If I spanked you a little bit today, know that it was the hand of the Lord and not mine. But it's not to spank, it's to encourage. Because the fear of the Lord is not to discipline us. The fear of the Lord is our reverence to him. I often say, you know, I fear my wife greatly. Half my weight, man's about that tall, I fear her greatly. I fear her so much that there is no way in, you know, <laughs> I am stretching my own little Baptist bubble right now. <laughs> there is no way in, or that word, starts with an H. <laughs> that for a fleeting few moments would I risk my marriage because of the pain that she would feel and the pain that my son and my daughters would feel and the music that's playing on Violetta's phone. <laughs> I was watching her trying so hard, the ringtone. <laughs> There's no way I could risk for a moment my marriage because just of my family alone, not alone you all in this ministry. And so I have a fear of my wife. And that fear is that I refuse to hurt her, if at all possible. That's the fear I'm talking about, the fear of the Lord. That I have a covenant with him in such a way but I refuse to every bit of my potential to not hurt him, to not abuse his sacrifice for my life, to not abuse his heart, his love, his compassion. I don't want to abuse Father God, the creator of all things, by some stupid 
moment of sin. But I do know one thing, that if I do become stupid, even for a moment, it doesn't change his love for me. Because in that love is where his forgiveness centers. And so I look at all of us. There's not one of us in this room that is not already forgiven. Even the sinner is forgiven. They just don't know it yet, and they haven't asked for it yet. But every one of us, it doesn't matter where you're at, what you've done. What matters right now is, will truth set you free? Because truth is wisdom. It's a relationship with the man called wisdom, and his name is Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus Christ. Can we have a piano or something going? And I hope if anyone came in in bondage or captive today, that you walk out these doors in freedom because the fear of the Lord is strength. And we will mount up with wings as eagles. We will walk this earth as a roaring lion. A lion that has such a deep voice that when he roars, the ground's vibrations go for miles. A lion that doesn't have fear very often. You're, you're the king of the beasts. We should be beasts. We should be strong. and not grow weary. Oh, I tell you, I get tired. I am just looking at my schedule over the next six weeks, and I'm getting tired looking at my schedule. But I know one thing. When we're weak in, spirit, weak in, in, uh, in the carnal nature, he is strong. When we are weak in the spirit of man, he is strong. He'll never leave us, and he'll never forsake us. He has never let you or I go. He holds us. I don't know how to end it. This message, I haven't even gotten to the message fully, but I know one thing. He does. I don't know what everyone's walking through. We don't even have Ustream up today. I know someone had already phoned in and said, hey, why is the Ustream not up? We don't have a computer. <laughs> but I know one thing. God is faithful for everything. 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 And I want us to close today in a fire tunnel. And that fire tunnel will mean whatever you want it to mean. You can go through that tunnel. If you don't know what a fire tunnel is, we get a bunch of torches. <laughs>
of his manifold bounty kingdom is ours. It's ours. Feel like I'm staring at the sun, but I feel no pain.